to um, our uh, Wednesday uh, noon seminar uh, featuring uh, Fred Ledley uh, from uh, Beverly, sorry, Bentley University in um, uh, Waltham, Mass. Uh, Fred came to my attention because he published a very interesting analysis in PNAS last year uh, showing that um, the 210 new drug approvals for, uh, by the US FDA in 2010 to 2016 were uh, enormously influenced by public uh, funding of, uh, of research uh, to the tune of north of $100 billion over a period of about 17 years. Uh, and um, that, uh, that inspired us to do, to do an analysis of how the PDB was impacting those same 210 uh, drug approvals, and those, those results have, have also been published. So we're very fortunate to have Fred uh, visiting here today to talk about, about his work and to explore possible uh, collaborations with the, uh, with the Protein Data Bank. He's uh, currently a department chair of the Department of Natural and Applied Sciences at, uh, at Bentley. Uh, prior to um, uh, coming, to, you know, prior to uh, uh, arriving in, uh, in Massachusetts, he uh, had a series of, uh, of roles in, uh, in, in for-profit companies. He was the scientific co-founder of Gene Medicine, Inc and uh, was uh, an assistant investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, and also um, a, a tenured associate professor there at, uh, at Baylor. Uh, he trained as an MD at uh, Georgetown uh, University after um, uh, bachelor's training in physical sciences at uh, the University of Maryland. He was a clinical fellow and uh, intern resident at Boston Children's Hospital in uh, pediatric medicine. And from there, he went to the lab of uh, David Baltimore, where he was a postdoc, and then on to uh, work with <clears throat> Savio Wu at, at Baylor before becoming a Baylor uh, faculty member. He's, uh, he's won uh, numerous uh, awards and has uh, played influential roles in a variety of um, advisory capacities and, uh, and is now doing this at, uh, at Bentley as uh, a senior member of the faculty and uh, um, scientific entrepreneur. So it's great to have you here talking about the acceler accelerating the translation of scientific discoveries for public value. Thanks for coming, Fred. Okay, um, well, thank you. It's uh, Stephen, it's really great to be here and um, in some respect, this is uh, one of the reasons I was really interested in coming and learning more about PDB was my very first job I ever had as a high school student was with Margaret Dayhoff, um, uh, working on the Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure. And I only see two people smiling, so only two people remember back, three people smiling back that far, um, when um, analyzing protein structure was very different. And um, uh, that was a, a great start to my career. And um, also um, part of the theme that I'll talk about today, which is being aware of how rapidly our science changes. And we thought that being able to align protein sequences and uh, identify families of proteins was incredibly sophisticated which it was in the 1970, early 70s. Um, and I think very few people, and I think Margaret Dayhoff was one, um, had the vision of where this would go and what it would become. And um, I will say my, Margaret actually worked with my father who um, was a member of the RNA tie club, uh, even back further and believed he could predict the genetic code by looking at DNA sequences. There are only two problems as no one could sequence DNA in those days. And he wrote an amazing paper describing his algorithm in, uh, this is about um, several years after the uh, DNA was discovered. And in the last paragraph of his paper, he says, well, this algorithm will work, but if we started running it on a computer at the time of the Roman empire, <laughs> 
the algorithm would only finish running now. And, um, and that's the algorithm that would have done what Nuremberg finally did experimentally to decipher the genetic code. And, and um, that's a very dramatic example, but this is happening to us every day. That we read about discoveries, we read about advances, um, um, and we read about people talking about how those advances are going to cure disease, lead to new drugs and everything else, but it's more complicated than that. And that's what we study. So listening to Stephen talk about my bio, besides realizing I have a short attention span, um, there is a common thread. And the common thread is that I have very much a physician brain and I want science to be applied. And having worked with some just amazing scientists in my career and being very fortunate to do that, um, it is somewhat disappointing when I look around and see all the things that are not working. And 90% of all the drugs that people take into clinical trials today are not going to work. They're going to fail. Think about that for a second. The smartest scientists you have, your colleagues, your professors, it's hard to imagine that they're actually wrong 90% of the time. I mean, but so what's going on here and how can we do better? And so we're treating this like a system that we can now study. And that's the story that I'll be talking about today. So um, our, we have a center we call the Center for Integration of Science and Industry. And our mission is what's described as the title here, that our mission is to find ways to accelerate this translation, this, this magic of taking a scientific discovery and creating something that helps the public. And what we'd like to do is to maximize public value, which of course begs the question of what's public value. And the concept that basic science is supposed to do this goes back to the 1940s in a very famous document called Science, the Endless Frontier by Vannevar Bush. Um, and this is one of my favorite hyperbolic paragraphs ever written, that advances in science when put to practical use mean more jobs, higher wages, shorter hours, abundant crops, more leisure. And most importantly, learning how to live without the deadening drudgery, which has been the burden of the common man. Pretty ambitious, right? Sounds great. Uh, also, don't forget prevention of disease, natural resources, and of course, military applications. So when we, we talk about science being translated, we're not only talking about getting a drug out. There are gonna be a lot of people involved, ranging from scientists to physicians, to investors, non-trivial part of the story, to university administrators, I'll probably leave them out today, to politicians. And everyone's role is absolutely critical to the success of this translational enterprise. Now, this doesn't go that well, right? We're excited by it. Those of you who are doing it day to day and those of you who are students who are here to learn it, the bad news is this is really hard. Some of my favorite quotes is, you know, Buzz Aldrin, the second man to ever walk on the moon, had a, a wrote an MIT tech review a number of years ago. You promised me Mars colonies, and instead you gave me Facebook. And I will say, for people in my generation, it's inconceivable that we don't have colonies on the moon today. It was obvious in the 1960s. It was just the next step. Why didn't it happen? And there are many examples here. If you want to be really depressed, read this article by Paul Krugman which was in the New York Times several years ago, where he talks about living his life in a state of technological disappointment. Because we promise so much, but we don't always deliver. So what do I mean by don't deliver? Obviously, look around you. This computer here is amazing. We can do the most amazing things. But when we actually go measure what we're creating, the results are much more complicated. So a book published several years ago uh, by Robert Gordon, he had a, a, a paper in the, with the National Bureau of Economic Research in 2012, 
it was a book that was published about four years later, he pointed out that all the technological advances since 1980, 1980, by the way, was the year that the computer it was Time Magazine's man of the year. This was the when Apple started putting out computers, IBM followed, a time of massive technological excitement in advance. Followed 20 years later by the dot-com explosion, the internet was going to change everything in the economy. But when you look at economic growth, economic growth has been slowing. So the red is the annual change in economic growth. But since the 1980s, there's been a steady decline in growth of our GDP. How could that be? There should have been a hockey stick increase. If technology, if, if the computing and the internet, the internet, by the way, was launched in 1996. That's exactly where GDP growth almost came to a halt. How could that be? Right? If anything, computers should make us more productive. Productivity is a major input to, actually, it's probably one of two major inputs to the GDP. How could this be slowing? If you look at drug development, which is our field, uh, I put some milestones on this of when the genetic code was determined, first for recombinant DNA, the Asilomar conference, which really released this technology to be widely applied, the first tyrosine kinase, the first human genome sequence. These are massive advances in science. You would expect an exponent, a hockey stick, again, an inflection point where we began to be more productive in bringing drugs to market, and it didn't happen. Okay, the last couple of years have been pretty good. That may or may not be a trend. When I first made this slide about three, I think I first made the slide um, here, with this point here. The day the FDA announced how many drugs they had approved the previous year, I found three press releases. One from the National Venture Capital Association said, good news, we're doing better. One from the Associated Press said, bad news, it went down. And the FDA said, yeah, kind of been keeping with historical trends. And, you know, so I drew a nice <laughs> curve through this. Is that a trend? Yeah, I don't know. It's had a good R, it doesn't have a great R squared value. Basically, there's no inflection point here, right? How come all of the things we're doing are not creating more efficient process? So as we think about this problem, we begin with the premise that this isn't only about science. It's about a system by which we take that science and now translate it into products, into all those lists of things that the endless frontier promised. And in particular, it requires a synergy between science and business. So our logo, our, we're very proud of our swirl, is to symbolize the confluence of science and business coming together. Because those of you who have worked in industry know that they're not always in perfect synergy. Those of you who have asked for people to invest in your science know that you, they, they may turn you down and then they go invest in something and you're sitting there scratching your head. Why did they invest in that? We know it doesn't work. Everyone had that experience, right? You're in a big company, you go to a meeting once a year. Are they always choosing the best science, right? You, and we're really interested in this interface because decisions are made that we hope are based on science, but they also have to be based on business because it's the industry that's providing the capital to do what we want to do, the labor, the markets. They're managing it and they're not managing it by the way we think it should be managed. They're managing it by the way management researchers think things should be managed. And ultimately development it, while there's a scientific component, is also very much about markets. And those who have been part of getting a drug approved know that even the design of clinical trials 
is strongly influenced by business and industry criteria. How you design your trial is totally, has to be in complete synchrony with how you want to define your market. Okay, so how to, so to us, this is a system and it requires a systems approach. So the first, the central rule of improving any system is, this is my favorite Don Berwick quote. It's really not from him. I'm sure he stole it. I just can, I can't track down who he actually stole it from. Um, but the idea is that systems do what they're designed, what they're structured to do. And the famous observation in management research is an assembly line where every car has 20 defects. It's perfectly designed to give your car 20 defects. If you want less defects, you have to fix the system, not just tell people to do a better job. And our argument is that our system is perfectly designed to get out 40 drugs a year. That's what we've been doing for the last 30 years. So how do you try to improve the system? And I don't have a slide for it, but the first thing you do is measure everything in sight, right? So I teach management courses too. And that's the first rule. Anyone who's worked in a pharmaceutical company knows quality management requires you to measure everything. Okay. So we began our work looking at this inefficiency of product development with an observation that comes from systems engineering. Um, and in systems engineering, it's well recognized that the biggest predictor of product success is the maturity of the underlying technology. Okay, so if you're building a, well, maybe Boeing hasn't learned, they used to be my example of one that learned this lesson, but they're not anymore. If you wanna build an airplane, you don't go find the, the most recently discovered composite material. You don't just build an airplane out of it, take it outside, see if it will fly. You require that technology if you're the Air Force or if you're the Defense Department, you go through technology readiness assessments. You have to score it, it has to be reviewed. There are all sorts of criteria because you know that until it's mature, you have a pretty high chance of failure. And the work of Clay Christensen at Harvard in a very famous book called The Innovator's Dilemma uh, put it to a, a semi-quantitative model where he describes the advance of a technology uh, as an S-curve. It's a typical logistic equation like everything else in the world. This is probably a laser, right? Is that right? Ah, yes. Okay. And he argues that at the bottom end of this technology maturation curve, um, there may be some things you can do with that technology, but it's probably not sufficient to meet the market requirements. And it's not until you go through this period of exponential growth that you can begin to meet a market standard. And I won't go through uh, his research. It's a, a somewhat dated book called The Innovator's Dilemma, but it's very much change management thinking in technology development. And people have done this on everything from computers and computer disks and chips to earth moving equipment. It's, it's, it's quite a remarkable book. So Laura McNamee, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my group, she was the first postdoctoral fellow in my group, um, asked the question, do we see something similar in biomedical research? Is there a point where when we discover a new target or we have a new chemistry or we have a new method where we know enough about it to, to do an experiment that works in mice and we can publish in a good journal, maybe we can get a patent on it, but maybe it's not really ready for the market demands yet. And we don't have a market. We have the FDA that tells us what the market is. And could we come up with an algorithm that actually maps the advance of basic science? And if so, would we see a threshold where we can begin to achieve FDA approval? Uh, this was the slide, there's supposed to be a couple of slides back. Okay, so this is exactly what we did. We practiced actually by fitting curves to a classic model, which is the speed of an Intel chip. So this is the fastest Intel chip over a 30 year period. It does, this is actually not a logistic equation. It's an exponentiated logistic equation. So this is a log, not a linear scale. 
And the same equation that, that can be fit to the advance of a technology like an Intel chip, in fact, can be fit through the accumulation of publications for in basic in PubMed on a particular target or a particular technology. So we call this a time model, technology, innovation, maturation, evaluation. It's the only good acronym our team ever came up with. Where this is looking at the cumulative publications, we fit it to this exponentiated logistic equation, and we define two points. And there's nothing special here. This is just math. We just know how to take derivatives. So the TI, what we call the initiation point of the research, is the point of maximum acceleration of publication activity. And what that does is it leads into this period of exponential growth. And then there's a point of maximum slowing. We call that an established point. Okay, nothing magic in a group that does serious math, like, like you, many of you guys do, this is probably slightly embarrassing, but it works. So our three prototypes, which uh, Laura McNamee published, where we looked at the accumulation of publications on gene therapies, on monoclonal antibodies, and on nucleotide therapeutics. So those of you who know the monoclonal antibody story, the Nobel Prize winning experiments by Kohler and Milstein were performed in 1973 when I was an intern at the Boston Children's Hospital in the late 70s, we probably had 20 different clinical trials going on of injecting mouse monoclonal antibodies into, into children, particularly to treat cancer. Turns out that wasn't very smart to inject mouse proteins into people. We didn't know that at the time. We really did not know it at the time. Um, in 1986, a product was approved, a, pro a drug called Orthoclone. It didn't work. It was off the market in two years. And it wasn't until 96 that the first monoclonal antibody for human use that actually worked would be approved, 25 years after the Nobel Prize winning experiments were performed. Now, that's the easiest class of drugs in the world to get approved. There are five to 10 monoclonals approved every year, okay? So this looks a lot like the curve that Clay Christensen described. Gene therapy also fits a nice curve. This was the first gene therapy uh, approved some years ago. Actually, I need to update this curve. Next is a terrible graph and axis is off. I need to get rid of it. There's, there's three, if you count CAR-T, there are half a dozen gene therapies now on the market, nucleotides was similar. There was an antisense approved in the mid 90s, vitravine by, uh, now it's called um, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. That also was taken off the market. Now there are three or four nucleotide therapeutics on the market. So this looks like the pattern that you see in other fields. We have done this on hundreds of different technologies now. And uh, we'll add one, caveat to this, which is that there are two ways to discover drugs. The old fashioned way of discovering drugs is called phenotypic discovery. It still works, by the way, we don't do it enough. Phenotypic discovery is you go to the Amazon, you talk to the shaman who tells you the root, the bark of that tree has remarkable properties. So you take some of the bark of the tree, you go back to your lab, you purify the molecule, you find taxol, or most of our, most drugs before the 1970s were discovered this way. And you have no idea how it works until you first have the drug. You might even have it on the market before you know how it works. So for those, which are the, the tan lines here, there's no relate, the X axis is years from our established point. So this is kind of the progress of the research. There's no relationship between phenotypic discovery and the science, which is what you expect. But for targeted discovery, where you find the target, you characterize the target, you study the target, you work out the, 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 the you, you go to your database and you study the structure of the target. There you have a pretty normal distribution of approvals, 
an average of 11 years after this established point. Okay, so this is totally consistent with what you see in other fields, that there's a relationship between the maturation of the underlying technology. Not only that, the efficiency, now we know there are hundreds of trials done in here that fail for various reasons. We haven't figured out how to actually measure those. It's just a data availability problem. But to show you how powerful this is, if you begin the clinical trial, the first, what used to be called first use in man, before that was considered sexist. So the first dosing of a person. If you do that before this established point, it takes you an average of 11.2 years between the first dosing and product approval. If you begin after that point, it's 8.3 years. I gotta admit, I was really skeptical of this when, when Laura McNamee showed it to me for the first time, but we've done it in four other systems. Um, she did this first, looking at all recent drug approvals between uh, 2010 and 2014. We've repeated it on a study done by Jennifer Byerline in the group of all cardiovascular drugs. This goes back 50 years, so we, the math was more complicated. And we've just, in the last weeks, Andrew Acevedo, who's a recent um, postdoc in our lab, has repeated this on drugs approved over the last three years. So um, this is, is evidence that there's an association between um, the efficiency of development and approval. This actually was the very first study we ever did, which looked at all the cancer drugs. Here, we weren't looking at the target for the drug as much as we were looking at just research on groups of drugs. Each of these had a fairly unique search term we could use for abstracts in PubMed. The circles, the tan circles, again, are phenotypic discoveries. So those are happening while the science is going on. The green are drugs which are targeted discovery. And this is what's happened in cancer. Enormous amounts of money went into cancer research starting in the 70s. For many, many years, there was no change in the number of drugs being approved every year. But suddenly in the last decade, we're finally seeing the fruits of that work emerge as this technology becomes mature. Okay. So gene therapy is very personal to me because the first company I started was a gene therapy company. So in 1992, way down here, I founded Gene Medicine. Actually, the school founded Gene Medicine, technologies from my lab, as well as those of a number of my colleagues in the cell biology department. And it wasn't until the last year or so that a real gene therapy got approved. So we're very interested in what happened. Because I'll tell you, this stuff really worked in 1992. We could do anything in a mouse. We can cure anything in a mouse. It cured cancer, it cured immune diseases, it preserved muscle mass. What happened? Well, the conventional wisdom tells you, and everyone's heard this story, that in 1999, a a Jim Wilson did an experiment to treat a disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. He unwisely treated a young man named Jesse Gessinger, who died uh, due to a toxic reaction to the drug. The drug was probably bad. It was an adenovirus. It probably was badly manufactured, probably never should have been used in the first place. And the conventional wisdom tells you that this killed the field. There's only one problem with that. There's no evidence to support it. So if we graph the accumulation of publications on gene therapy, capital investment in gene therapy, the number of patents on gene therapy, and the number of clinical trials on gene therapy, here's where Jamie Gelsinger died, 1999. The only inflection point is in capital investment. Otherwise, there's no change. And anyone who remembers 1999 knows this is the peak of the dot-com bubble. And then there was enormous investment in anything. The next year, there was no investment in anything. There's a huge recession. And if you normalize this simply for 
investment in any other type of company, it looks the same. So there's actually no evidence that Jamie Gelsinger's stats had any material impact on this field. So that doesn't explain why this took 20 years. So why does it take 20 years? So we did a study where we tracked about 35,000 papers written on gene therapy, about 16,000 issued patents, and we also tracked the capital investment, the amount of money invested by, in public gene therapy companies. And it turns out over the last 20 years, there have been 59 gene therapy companies. And we could track the money using the types of databases that a business school has. We tracked 1,800 clinical trials. And we fit curves to, sorry, this is just pointing out that's where I started my company. Really the wrong place. OK. So we fit curves to five different types of gene therapy technologies. One is, unless you study the field, this may not mean much. One is the use of retroviruses, one adenoviruses, one adeno-associated viruses, one lentiviruses, and our own favorite was non-viral. So this kind of shows you for each of those, we get a, a reasonably good, quite good curve fit. Um, we looked at now, normalizing where is the investment happening, not in time, but where is the investment happening relative to the maturation of the technology? Because think about what happens, right? You publish a paper in Nature, discovering a new target for a drug. Everyone gets all excited. The venture capitalists call you up. They want to put money into this because it's so exciting. Then what happens five years later? You enter what's called the valley of death, right? You're much smarter. You know much more about it. Your technology is much better. No one will even answer your phone calls anymore, right? So there we have in this idea that at some point people stop investing and we ask, can we show that? So what you're looking at here is, uh, the top is dollars invested. The bottom is how many clinical trials were initiated. The left panel, this is just by year. This is in two year increments. And this looks like a pretty healthy field. The amount of investment goes up. This is the dot com bubble. That's the recession the next year. This makes all business research tricky because there was such a bizarre, um, this was with the time that was called irrational exuberance, it was. But then investment stays pretty level, actually. Number of clinical trials increased gradually, and then it was pretty level for about 20 years. That looks like a good field. You know, more people come in, pretty stable. If you plot the same data based on what we call the maturity index, and the maturity index is just where are you on this curve? We just normalize everything to the limit. So you're either halfway up the curve, 10% up the curve, 80% up the curve. What you found was all the money was invested in the bottom third of the curve. And a disproportionate number of clinical trials were started at the bottom of the curve. So what happens? Well, this technology, we believe, was simply not ready for prime time. People invested a lot of money and may not have made money, so they're not going to do that again. These clinical trials all failed. We actually don't think they could have succeeded because we don't think the technologies were mature. So the field became one where people were very disappointed with their investment. The academics here, if you're an academic, you're doing clinical trials or you're a company. If you're doing a company, you do a clinical trial that fails, your company is dead. If you're an academic, you try not to do that one again. So when the technology finally became mature, no, but very few people were investing and the number of clinical trials was really de minimis. This was about five years ago. There's been a renaissance. This technology really is mature now. And many companies, some of them local here, many in Boston are beginning to have great success with this. So our conclusion really was that the asynchrony between the maturation of the technology 
and the willingness of people to do the, the development work and make the investments to do that really was a contributing factor to what was a 20 year lag in gene therapy. Okay, so we've looked at other models now, but that's, that's my favorite because I'm still trying to figure out why my company failed. So, um, okay, so what are we looking at with this time model, right? We're counting publications. And again, that's pretty simplistic. Our original idea was that this was accumulation of knowledge and, and that's almost certainly wrong. What we think now is that this is more interesting. And this is a hypothesis. We don't have a lot of evidence for it yet. But we think what happens is this initiation point here, we're just calculating it by a derivative. But that date that we calculate almost always correlates with what an expert in the field will tell you is a seminal event. So we'll take a review article of someone who tells you the history of the field. They'll tell you what the most important paper was. That almost always corresponds to where we see this acceleration in publication activity. It's slightly more complicated than that because we don't always have, we don't always find papers down here because the vocabulary of the field may not yet be established. And I'll show you that in a second. Expo the only way to get exponential growth here is to have more people doing more research, right? For anyone who's a graduate student here, even if your advisor wants you to publish exponentially more every year for the next three years, it's not going to happen. You can't get exponential growth by working harder. You have to have more people in the field. So we think this initial discovery here leads lots of people to now jump on the bandwagon and study it. That's what happened with monoclonals. Everyone in the world jumped in to study monoclonals. That will give you exponential growth of, re of publication activity. And as long as that research is interesting, that phenomenon will continue. So what's interesting to a basic scientist? What's interesting to a basic scientist is you don't get the expected results. You discover something new. You find nuance, new nuances, you find new complexity, you come up with new insights. So as long as you keep getting new insights, as long as there's stuff to do that's never been done before, yeah, people are gonna keep working on the field. You'll still get graduate students to come work for you and postdocs to come work for you. Once you begin to get predictable, predictable results, once there aren't that many unanswered questions, people are gonna leave and go work on something else. That's how you get slowing. The point at which you can do an experiment and get the predictive, the result you expect without finding new complexities, without having to go study some other factor that you never knew about, that's also when a clinical trial will work. So this makes perfect sense. Okay, so what do we know about this? So we've started to apply machine learning to this. We're in the very early stages. And the first one was, we asked if we know the answer, can we see it doing text analysis? So with monoclonal antibodies, we kind of know why it took 25 years. That the early work involved these mouse proteins. Mouse proteins proved to be unsuitable for human applications. An entirely new set of technologies needed to be developed to make what are now human, fully human antibodies before we had fully human antibodies, we had humanized or chimeric. So if we simply look at word frequencies, the frequency of words that have to do with the mouse technologies like hybridoma, murine, ascites, these words disappear from the literature over time. And other words which relate to the human technologies like fully human, phage display, humanized, these words are present in increasing frequencies. So if we kind of know what's happening in the literature, this isn't rocket science, we can follow that over time. We've also done an experiment with um, Jürgen Eder, who's at Novartis, who published a paper some years ago, 
where he classified um, remark very, it's a lifetime labor of reading his literature. He looked at about 100 drugs and he identified all the most important papers in the development of that drug and he categorized them. We had to recategorize them, but he found the most important paper describing the target, the clinical indication, the first molecule, the final molecule, and so on and so forth. What we did is we fit uh, technology curves to each of the targets. So what you're looking at here is the maturation of the research on each target separately between zero and one. And we ask how mature was the technology when that article was published? And what we see is that for many of these, there's kind of a normal distribution. The arrow, green arrow here is that established point where the concept is established at about 50% of the way up the curve, the first molecule, uh, maybe about 56, 60%, the final molecule up around 80, 85%, then you work out the indication. So it looks like at different parts of this curve, different types of work are being done. Again, suggests the literature is gonna be informative. And so we then Jennifer Barlein and the group did some pilot work looking at word frequencies with the expectation that if the research is maturing, maybe the, the vocabulary we use to describe it is also changing. So what you're looking at here, this is just sort of the top 100 words in the literature describing the NMDA receptor. So the NMDA receptor is a target for um, an Alzheimer's drug. And as this cycles back, notice at the very beginning, the frequency of these words is gonna bounce around like crazy. And then it flattens out. So over the last two decades, there's almost no change. The most common words are still there. Every year, the infrequent words are infrequent. And if we look at this just as a scattergram, this is um, halfway up the curve in 1982. These are the words that are most frequent. Most of these words are absent 10 years later in 1983. Many of the words that are present in 1983 were not present at all in 82. And there's not much correlation in the frequency of the other words. Whereas if you look now from 1993 to the point of approval of the drug, in fact, the common words is a very high correlation between the words that are used to describe that technology. So it suggests that you have a maturation of the literature, uh, which we believe correlates to a more mature understanding of that science. This is CFTR, which was in the news yesterday for another CF drug being approved. Again, early on, lots of bouncing around of these terms, really flattens out. Scattergram is actually better than that. Between 1990 and 96, not much correlation at all between 96 and 2012 when the first drug was approved, a very high correlation. So we're just now gearing up to, to create the, the data sets we need to uh, start doing some cluster analysis on this. And um, the artificial intelligence here is even more complicated because we actually have not been reading the literature yet. And so we're not doing what many other outstanding groups are doing, which is looking at things like the binding affinity and the structures to try to come up with quantitative issues. We really think what we're looking at is the sociology of science, but we do think we're on the right track uh, and that there is something in here to measure, which we might turn into the sort of predictive algorithm we want. Now, this work led us into uh, well, it's a project that's kind of taken over the lab. Um, because we have these big databases with millions of abstracts, because we've been reading these and categorizing them, um, we began to ask, where is the money coming from for this research, for this basic science? And the question was prompted by, I had a postdoc in the lab who so watching C-SPAN was fun. She's now working for the government as a policy analyst, which is why she came to us in the first place. 
And she saw this encounter between Senator Dick Durbin and Francis Collins. This was about three years ago when the president had proposed cutting the NIH budget by 30%. Oops. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Collins. If I were to ask you whether or not NIH research was part of the development of a certain pharmaceutical drug or part of the development of a certain medical device, could you trace the lineage of the research so that you could tell me a yes or a no if NIH was involved? Sounds like an easy question, right? We all believe that. That's what we spend our, I think everyone here spends their whole career doing this. In fact, Francis Collins couldn't answer. Francis can answer, those who know him, he can answer anything. This one, he did come up with a number. He came up with 70%. We have no clue where he got that number from. Because in fact, no one had ever done the experiment. So we realized we had the wherewithal to do this experiment. And then Kat Cleary, working with Jennifer Byerline, who were really co-equal authors on this, if Jennifer hadn't moved on to a, a real job, she probably would have been the first author. But um, Kat is the our lead data analyst in the group. Um, and the, what we decided to ask was, if we wanted to answer Senator Durbin's question, we had to look not at applied science, but at basic science. Because the NIH explicitly tries to spend half of their research budget on basic science. They define basic science using a definition that goes back to my first slide, back to the endless frontier. They define it as research undertaken without a product or a process in mind. So if we wanted to track NIH funding, we had to look not only at the drug. The audiences I usually talk to, I have to explain this graphic, by the way. I don't think I have to do it here. Um, but um, we had to not only look at the, for business audiences, this takes 10 minutes, but we had to not only look at the literature on the drug, we had to look at the literature on the target for the drug. So we were going to define for this research literature that mentions the target but doesn't mention a drug as basic research and research that mentions the drug as applied research. And or just as a model, this is a teaching case you guys, I'm sure, know well. For example, venetoclax, which targets BCL2, um, there are 11,000 papers. Sorry, there's been 11,000 fiscal years of funding related to um, BCL2 and about 130 fiscal years of funding related to the drug. So what we did was we took 210 drugs, which were all the drugs approved from 2010 to 2016. We did literature searches on the drugs themselves and various synonyms for the drug name, and also searches on the targets. So these 210 drugs were against 150 different targets. Um, all the drugs were approved between 2010 and 16. And you could see from this that the accumulation of research was largely about the target. Clearly, as you got closer to approval, there's more and more research about the drugs, exactly what you expect. In total, we identified about, we identified 2 million research papers related to the targets or these 210 drugs. We then correlated this database. We cross-linked this to another database called Reporter. Reporter is the single worst database I've ever used in my life for anyone who's ever tried to use it. Stephen, I don't know if you tried to do this or not. Um, we identified 16 different spellings for Harvard. Um, yeah, well, Harvard's a particularly bad one. I would bet there's even, I haven't looked, but I would bet there's at least several for Rutgers too. It's just a completely uncurated database. We went so far as to call up the now retired NIH person who built it to say, can you help us figure out how to use this thing? But at the end of the day, we, we did uh, use it successfully. We were able to cross-link it to 
And what this does is it um, lists all the grants given by uh, HHS, uh, basically the NIH. Um, and it also has the PubMed identifiers for publications that are funded by that grant. We're not exactly sure where that comes from. It probably comes from the annual reports investigators file uh, every year to say you're doing good things with government money, but they also do have things published after the grant ends. So they must be doing it both ways. It's very hard to figure out what they exactly did. But meanwhile, what this lets us do is take those 2 million papers, ask whether it cites uh, NIH support, and um, this tells you how much support um, is given for each grant every year. So what we're able to do on the 210 drugs was track uh, all the publications, which was 2 million papers. We separate out the basic research and the applied research as either on the target of the drug. Of the 2,600,000 cited uh, NIH funding, that's about the right fraction of the number of papers published by US scientists as opposed to people around the world. That constituted 200,000 fiscal years of funding and a total cost. So this goes back to 1980. The costs only go back to 2000. Um, and we found $100 billion of NIH support for this research. Um, I will say this, we thought was an artifact originally. We were very worried about it until we realized that it became one of our most important confidence builders for the research. We didn't know why there was a jump here and then it leveled off until we realized that those were the years of funding for the American Recovery Reinvestment Act. And it gave us some confidence we were looking at something real. If the NIH got an extra 10% uh, on top of their budget those years. And we see that in the data. Just the summary data, this is all in the paper. And of this, of course, you know, it's very clear the vast majority of this money is going for the basic research, not the applied research. But 90 to 95% is research on the targets. Now, to truly ask how much government money, because remember, we started this in part because of our feeling that maturation was important to be able to bring a drug out. We want to know how much money is being spent in order to bring a new product to market, a new target to market. So for this, we looked at, there were 87 first-in-class drugs our definition of first in class for this project was it's against a previously undrugged target. We asked how much money is spent on that target before a first in class drug is approved. This is a, a much more complicated analysis for many reasons, because there might be multiple drugs in development for the same target and things like that. So we actually identified target clusters, which lumped research on any drug against that target, uh, not just one drug, because we didn't want to miss, we didn't want to underestimate. And um, what we found was an average of over $800 million of research was funded before the first drug came to market against that target. And another thing that gave us great confidence here was when we looked separately at the drugs that were first discovered by targeted drug discovery, or those that were discovered by phenotypic drug discovery, we actually saw the pattern was reversed. So that for a targeted discovery, the basic research, the research on the target, precedes research on the drug. For phenotypic discovery, as we and to say we expected it is an exaggeration, um, but the theory says that in here, research on the drug precedes research on the target, and that's exactly what we saw. So again, this is, for us internally, this was an important test of the sensitivity of this very complex model that we could pick up the difference between a targeted and phenotypic drug. So our conclusion was that NIH funding contributed to every single drug approved, from 2010 to 2016. 
it, uh, Francis Collins loved this, of course, because he could go right into press. He must have published his blog the next day. Um, I forget which one is his. Oh yeah, this is Francis's. And we sent it to him, obviously. Um, and because it gave him ammunition to keep, uh, in fact, the NIH budget was not cut. It's gone up the last three years as Congress shows a little bit of spine. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, and, and we mentioned this in the paper, but it was picked up of all academic places by The Motley Fool. Anybody know Motley? Anyone play with investment? Motley Fool actually published a paper about this. And they actually, it's shocking it was there. They pointed out this is a remarkably efficient use of federal money. That $100 billion we found represents 20% of the NIH budget since 2000. And remember, the NIH tries to spend half their budget on basic research. That's 40% of what the NIH thinks they're spending on basic science is already providing benefit to the public in the form of a new drug on the market. Now, of course, the fact the new drug is on the market means it's all also created a lot of jobs, created a lot of investment, probably created some new companies. OK? I think if a pharmaceutical company had a 40% success rate in where they put their money, they'd be thrilled. And we think of basic science as this random, not terribly efficient thing. This data says that's not quite right. It may be crowdsourced, because this is all investigator-initiated work. But this may be more efficient than we usually give ourselves credit for. So we were pretty happy with this. And then life got more complicated. When the New York Times wrote an article titled Paying Twice, a push for affordable prices for taxpayer funded drugs. And the author of this article in the Times, I, I shouldn't have blocked him out because he made my life much more complicated and, and also more interesting. Um, he argued that, gee, if taxpayers are paying for all the research, how come they're also paying so much for drugs? Now, that is a, a misinterpretation of our data, because remember, we said 90% of this money is going for basic science. We're still not counting the one and a half billion dollars that a, a company spends to bring the average drug to market. Okay, that said, this became a sensation. So my team comes to work every morning now, and the first thing they do is they go to the Twitter feed to see how many people have tweeted about our paper since the last night. I'm too old for Twitter, but it's OK. Um, the most important comment on this actually came from Alexandra Octasia Cortez. And I'll just play what she said. And this, this was at a House committee meeting uh, back in the spring. So the public is acting as early investor, putting tons of money in the development of drugs that then become privatized, and then they receive no return on, on the investment that they have uh, made. Right. You're familiar with the study that shows that between 2010 and 2016, of every drug, all 210 drugs that were approved by the FDA were funded by the NIH or public money. Would it be correct, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, to characterize the NIH money that is being used in, in development and research as an early investment? Yes. So the public is acting as an early investor in the production of these, um, in the production of these drugs. Is the public receiving any sort of direct return on that investment from the highly profitable drugs that are developed from that, from that research? Uh, no, in most cases, uh, there isn't, when, those, when those products are eventually handed off to a for-profit company, there aren't uh, licensing deals that bring money back into the coffers of the NIH. That usually doesn't happen. So the public is acting as early investor, putting tons of money in the development of drugs that then become privatized, and then they receive no return on, on the investment that they have uh, made. Right. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Okay. Anderson, uh, I, I have I a question. Hope.
I do hope someone's bringing tons of money into Rutgers for you guys. Um, it's not my experience, but um, so um, this goes on. She was talking to Aaron Kesselheim. Those of you who know, he's a Harvard professor, runs the program in um, research and law and, and medicine or something. Um, The theoretical foundation of her question in tax policy, I'll leave to a different audience at some point, but it did raise the question for us, what is the monetary return that's coming back for the scope of this investment? I gotta say the $100 billion is more money than we thought we'd find. And I, we, you know, I'll, I'll tell you when Dr. Cleary first brought me the results and she found $100 billion, I sat there and said, that can't be right. It's too much. Go back, check it. And it's right. We check this one. Um, we used to say that basic research was cheap compared to development. But in fact, it says it's the same order of magnitude. So I do think this changes the equation in terms of how we think about basic science, the cost of basic science. And perhaps it should change where we think about the return on basic science. So um, I will say this in the last weeks, um, um, our paper has had new, there's been another surge on this paper. Uh, Chris Van Hollen, who's the Senator from Maryland and um, Peter DeFazio, who's a representative from um, Oregon have both introduced acts in Congress to um, basically say every time the FDA approves a drug, they should do our analysis. Now they haven't offered to have us do the analysis, but that they should do our analysis, figure out how much uh, federal money went into it. And if it's a lot of money, the government should be able to control the price. I'm not necessarily a fan of this, but again, my team is all excited about this. The school's very excited about this too, okay. So the question then is, um, what's the return that people are getting on this? And it's actually very hard to find data. We did identify some data in a consulting group that's tracked about three or 4,000 biotech licenses over the last couple of years and has a collection of data from both academic licenses, which is you guys licensing to a company, and also corporate licenses, which is one company licensing to another company. You would expect the value of these licenses to be somewhat different. The dogma is that academics do more early stage research. A company is more likely to be licensing later stage products. Um, and in fact, that's what you see in this database that of all the licenses coming from academic or government labs, uh, there are no approved products here, whereas these are the approved going from one company to another. There are no applications filed here. There are only three phase three products, and there aren't even that many phase two products. Whereas here for a corporate license, there are approved products, nearly approved products, and so on and so forth. But if we normalize for that, so you're looking here at the royalty rate paid is in the terms of the license. So this is, I don't know if Rutgers, I should have looked to see if records is in the database, I guess you guys probably are. The, the tan here is what you would expect to see, right? I've been on both sides of this one in my career. If you license a discovery or maybe a lead molecule, you have a fairly, you expect a low royalty rate. If you have, if you just filed for approval, you expect to get about 25%. That smells right, right? The more mature your molecule, the bigger royalty you should receive. But those are for corporate licenses. Look what's happening with the academic licenses. First of all, they're a third to a fifth. The, the magnitude of the corporate license at the same level of maturity. And there's no gradation. So the academics are not getting any more for a phase two molecule than they are from a discovery molecule. This is about 600 license agreements, okay? If you look at the size of the deals, and this is way more complicated, the total amount of cash involved in the deal, academics aren't in the same ballpark, pre-commercial payments, not in the same ballpark, 
This is not as unreasonable because many of these are biotech company partnering with a large pharma, where the large pharma is basically supporting the smaller company, funding the research, funding the development, and things like that. So there, but it does beg the question, and this is what we were talking about earlier, is as universities become much more sophisticated in their ability to, to do this work at the same level of quality or even more advanced than the companies, how come they're not paying for it in the, in the, in the academic centers? Okay. So we don't know the answer to that one yet. We do know that part of the answer, and we're just starting to do the math. As usual, the math is more, more complicated than you expect. We do know the biggest difference is the academics are almost exclusively licensing to biotech companies. So these are biotechs or new IPOs and much less frequently licensing directly to a pharma. Whereas this is the same graph, I just tilted it the other way. Kat Cleary told me not to show this. It doesn't hit her high standards of data analysis. Um, but here it's just backwards. When a small company licenses, it's always going to a large company. So some of this may have to do with the nature of the company. Remember, these biotechs don't have any money to begin with. So they, the academics may be getting short shrift. Those who remember that this is all governed by the Bayh-Dole Act. The first iteration of the Bayh-Dole Act actually gave preference to small companies because small companies were thought to be better generators of jobs and economic growth. That act was amended when it got renewed about six years later and that clause was eliminated. But universities do give preference to small companies. Remember, many of these companies may have been founded by yourselves or your colleagues. So it's, it's how you are keeping control of science, but maybe you should be more valuable in that case because you're bringing know-how and there's a lot of evidence that companies that maintain close association with their founding scientists in fact, they're more likely to get drugs out. They're more likely to be successful. So we think this probably, if in, in a proper regression analysis, will probably explain much of the difference between the, the royalty rates being paid to academics. But it simply begs the question of whether the system, a little bit the question that uh, Representative Octavia Cortez asked, is whether the public is getting an equitable return on the work you guys are doing. And I will say, without going into the Bayh-Dole Act in great detail, there were two, two foundations. The Bayh-Dole Act did two things. One is it authorized your school to patent inventions made with government money. And then it required you to try to license that to industry to create jobs and economic growth and products. Okay. That was half of the Bayh-Dole Act. The other half was the government didn't want to be in the business of collecting royalties. That's kind of an odd thing for a government to do. So the government said that you as a nonprofit institution could receive those royalties. And since I'm sure somewhere in Rutgers Charter, you are incorporated in the public interest. Since you're a nonprofit, that phrase will be there. If that money is paid to Rutgers, that money is going back to the public domain so that you are in fact a proxy for the taxpayers and you're spending it on what you think the taxpayers will spend it on, education, research, service to your communities. So um, in fact, this money going back to the schools is the money she was asking about. And Aaron Kesselheim's answer was really wrong. The public is being paid back. Our question is whether it's equitable. Um, there's a very odd concept in business called fair market value. Um, I torment my stu business students with this. Fair market value is not fair in the least. Fair market value simply means whatever someone's willing to pay for it. So this is fair market value that academics are getting, um, but it may not be equitable. And we're looking at this further. Okay, um, what time is it? I should tie this up or? Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through the, what the biotech companies are doing. I will tie it up with this slide. So um, we're, our, our efforts are trying to take a view of translational science, 
um, which is learning from not only the the science but but this vortex. And I think you know what we're finding is that the business and science are very much related, uh, as is public policy. We were aware that we had to pay attention to public policy. Um, we didn't think we'd be pulled into it quite this deeply, but we do think we can make a difference. I actually spent most of the night answering an email from another congressman who wanted to know if we had data. Uh, had we updated our paper yet? And in fact, we are planning to update it in January once we have a full decade of data, um, and also answering other questions that have come up. Um, it is important. Uh, we do feel the funding for the basic science enterprise is very much at risk. Uh, government funding is threatened every year by this administration. This is uh, worse than ever, but not new. Uh, historically, it's very easy to make fun of basic science. There used to be something called the Golden Fleece Award, if anybody remembers William Proxmire, uh, who would make fun of research on worms, not understanding that that's where we would learn about apoptosis. Um, industry is fun. We were reminiscing in the past a time when some of the greatest basic research was done in companies. Sir James Black won Nobel Prizes for the work done in developing Tagamet and Propranolol. Um, and uh, that largely is not done in, in large pharmaceutical companies anymore. They're really relying on you to do this work. Um, and there really is a need to continually emphasize the importance of the work you guys do to be very attentive to the threats, to the funding of this work, because our data says it is the critical mass of what you're doing here that makes all the difference in the world. So if you needed a pep talk, you just got a pep talk. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great to be here. Thank, thanks very much, Fred. Uh, I'd like to take the chairman's prerogative.